Brethren, it is now my pleasure to introduce you to Worshipful Brother Michael Barry Michael Steadman. Barry is an Essex Freemason, the province of London, and was initiated into Tudor Lodge number 6947 in 1987, where he was subsequently passed and raised, and became Master of the Lodge in 1995. His love for the craft is being such that he joined Noor Lodge number 3610 and Guy Germain Lodge number 9506 respectively thereafter. Barry is a trustee of the Friends of Prince Edward, Duke of Kent Court, which is a Royal Benevolent Institution home in Stidsett, Essex, and was appointed President of the Association last year. Barry is also a member of the Holy Royal Arch, Pritterwell Chapter number 4896, and has been through all three of the chairs twice. In his personal life, Barry is a broadcast TV cameraman by trade for almost 40 years and spent 20 years with Sky TV, culminating in being appointed head of cameras. He is now freelance, working for Channel 5, Sky, Channel 4 and the BBC. Barry is married and has two grown-up children and a grandson. A man of many talents, when he's not on tour with either his camera book or his camera or his ritual book, Barry plays guitar with a blues rock band, touring venues the length and breadth of Essex and further afield. So equally talented, both behind and in front of the camera. Worshipful brother, Barry Michael Steadman, the floor is yours. Thank you, Amy. And thank you for inviting me to, uh, to deliver this talk. Um, I'd like to begin by saying that, um, first of all, there's been some uh, mention on the Facebook page with regards to the logo. I wasn't responsible for that, so don't blame me for that please um this talk didn't start out as a talk actually um i visit a lodge in munich quite often i haven't done for the last year admittedly but i visit a lodge in munich and it's a lodge called lessing zum flammenden which i discovered was the flaming star of lessing now i knew nothing about lessing um so i decided to just look him up and it grew to this this talk um, it took about a year to put together, primarily because the internet is a great source of information, but it's an even better source of misinformation. And so every time I found something I thought was a fact, I found out it was actually fiction. So it took a long while to sift it all out. And a, and a, a German Freemason friend of mine went through it all, and he seemed reasonably happy with it. Um, one final point I'd like to make is that because I normally deliver this to lodges within the English constitution and specifically around Essex, um, there are references to, for example, the signs. They obviously relate to the English constitution, but it may be different to yours. Anyway, here we go, the enemy and the craft. It's something of a coincidence that while English Freemasonry went through a crisis in the 1700s with the ancients and the modern split, so too did German Freemasonry. However, their crisis went virtually unnoticed, but eventually proved to be greater and more far-reaching than ours. In 1770, the Prussian government became suspicious of Freemasonry. They tried to become involved in it as a means to watch over it and control it. Their fears were justified. A man by the name of Adam Weishaupt was initiated into, ironically, the Lodge of Caution in Munich. He went on to bring others into the Lodge, all were members of the Order of the Illuminati, an organisation hell-bent on causing chaos and revolution. Adam Weishaupt founded the Bavarian branch of the Illuminati. His original inner council was structured around the pentagram. His council consists comprised of five men. Sir Francis Dashwood of the Satanic Hellfire Club, Alphonse de Sade, from whom the word sadism is derived, Maya Anschel Rothschild, founder of the powerful banking house of Rothschild, and Colmer, an occultist. Rothschild financed the organization and with 12 influential Jewish friends, they called themselves the elders of Zion. And with this background of bankers, devil worshippers and sadists, it's hardly surprising that Freemason has been subject to so many rumors in the past. But it has to be remembered that Freemasonry was not a willing partner to the Illuminati. Indeed, it's doubtful that most Masons were even aware of its existence in the beginning. Remember the words of Dr. Oliver? Be very cautious who you recommend as a candidate for membership. I imagine someone regretted bringing Adam Weishaupt into the craft. 
Now, the purpose of this infiltration of German Freemasonry was to get close to government officials, the rich and influential, and of course, royalty. In addition, they compiled records of members, which they hoped to use to destabilize the government and hasten a new world order, controlled, of course, by themselves. Now, these records will prove to be quite significant later on. Incidentally, the Illuminati are alleged to have done the same within other governments, banking, commerce, the military and the media. At the time Weishaupt became a Freemason, the Illuminati was still very much in its infancy. They had a plan, but there was very little structure to the organisation. They set it up along the lines of Freemasonry, partly because it was easier to mimic something already in existence, and partly because they believed it'd be more attractive to those who were already Freemasons. They were very selective. They only invited the rich and powerful and preferably young and easily influenced. They claimed that once the third degree had been attained, their connection with the occult would give members special powers. When they discovered the truth, of course, they were already in too deep to back out. By the time the Illuminati lost interest in Freemasonry, they had over 3,000 members. Their own lodges and quasi-Masonic ritual an influence to rival that of the Grand Lodge of Germany. The Bavarian Illuminati disappeared as quickly as it had arrived, but the theory is that Germany had such a well-ordered society that any chance for a successful coup was ruled out, so the plan was abandoned. However, it's well documented that Weisholz and his followers went to France, and within a few years, the French Revolution started. You can make of that what you will, but the outcome was exactly what the Illuminati would have helped for. Freemasonry, as we know, does not require any adherence to a particular religion, only a belief in a supreme being. In Germany, Jews were denied admission because of their religion and birthright. But this was not Nazi Germany, this was the Germany of 1770. The future Kaiser Wilhelm I was the patron of the three Berlin Grand Lodges for many years, and he decided that Jews would only be admitted if there was a unanimous agreement. Now, since one of the Grand Lodges was known to be adamant against accepting Jews, this forced the others who wanted to be more tolerant to maintain an anti-Jewish policy. A man by the name of Gotthold Ephraim Lessing was a German dramatist and poet. He was also a Freemason. Lessing was initiated into a lodge in Hamburg and was made a master mason on October the 14th, 1770. At this time, Frederick the Great was the Grand Master in Prussia and many prominent Germans became Freemasons because of that monarch. Among them was the Duke of Brunswick. Lessing had an important job as a librarian to the Duke. It was a job he couldn't afford to lose. He also had a close friend in the person of the Jewish philosopher, Moses Mendelssohn. Mendelssohn was deeply hurt that Lessing had entered a society from which he was excluded. This upset Lessing and he wrote some harsh criticisms of what he saw as hypocrisy in an order that promoted brotherly love. Lessing's actions angered the Duke and although he narrowly kept his job, he was ordered not to publish anything further that might be considered controversial. As a dramatist, Lessing hit on the idea of using the stage to correct this injustice in German Freemasonry. The result was a play called Nathan the Wise, a plea for religious tolerance. It's about the meaning of a Mason's obligation. Lessing meant his play to be a reminder to all Masons that they've entered into a solemn and binding obligation to their order and that no man should view their religion as the only road to salvation. It's interesting to note that even today, Freemasonry receives some of its sharpest criticism from those who believe their religion is the only road to salvation. Incidentally, way back in the 18th century, Lessing had a theory that Freemasonry evolved from the Knights Templar in the 14th century. However, at the time, this was rejected. Lessing led a rather tragic life. He waited a number of years to marry Eva Connick, the widow of a merchant. She died two years later giving birth to a son who was also had a tragically short life. Lessing died on February the 15th, 1781 at the age of just 52, three years after the death of his wife and before German lodges dropped their ban against Jews. 
German Freemasonry has lessons to thank for eventually allowing men of all religions into the fraternity. Records show that Moses Mendelssohn later became a member of the Illuminati, although his motives in doing so are unclear. In 1920, a Grand Lodge in Czechoslovakia was named the Grand Lodge Lessing of the Three Rings. The Nazis destroyed this Grand Lodge, however, as a lodge in Munich named Lessings on Flammenstern or the Flaming Star of Lessing. As we all know, Hitler did not tolerate Freemasonry. There was only one other group that Nazis and fascists treated with equal hatred to the Jews. And believe it or not, it was Freemasons. In 1935, almost 200 years after the founding of the first German lodge, the Nazi regime declared the Masonic fraternity to be an enemy of the state and years of darkness followed. Many brethren whose only crime was merely being a member of our order were executed in concentration camps. Masonic temples and lodge buildings were looted and destroyed, and records and property confiscated. And yet the horrors uh, when those infamous camps are remembered, there's little said about the fate of Freemasons. That our brethren were among the victims of Nazi persecution and minus abomination are seldom if ever mentioned. In addition to the confiscation and appropriation of all German Masonic Lodge property, 80,000 German Masons were put to death following the seizing of Grand Lodge records and containing their names and addresses. Another 5,000, whose names had not yet been entered into the books of Grand Lodge, were spared, but only because their identities were unknown. By the law of averages, some of the brethren must of course have been Jews. However, we should remember they were executed because they were Freemasons. There's been much speculation as to why Hitler hated Freemasons in the way he did. He blamed the state of the German economy predominantly on Jews and Freemasons. Some say he'd been refused admission into Freemasonry, although there's no documentation to support the theory. It's also been suggested the Nazi salute was a mocking parody of the first degree sign. One thing certain, it was fear that led Nazis to execute Freemasons rather than leaving them in concentration camps. The very nature of what we stand for opposes everything the Nazis stood for. Freemasons at that time, and particularly in Germany, were rich and powerful people and 80,000 like-minded brethren posed a very real threat to Hitler. And as we know, anyone who posed a threat was disposed of. Take, for example, the stormtroopers. They were originally little more than street thugs, but they became very powerful and independent and were loyal to their generals. There were not that many of them, but it didn't take many to elect Hitler. It happened because of apathy and disillusion of politicians among the electorate. They helped Hitler come to power, and after doing so, he invited their generals to his castle and had them shot. In 1923, Hitler attempted to overthrow the government. He burst into a beer hall in Munich, where a rally was taking place, and he fired a pistol in the air and announced he was taking the government officials hostage. He was thrown into prison, and while he was there, he wrote Mein Kampf, which set out his plans to invade Europe. It also attacked Freemasons, blaming them and Jews for the state of the economy. When the exchange rate hit 3 million marks to the dollar, people started listening to him, and of course, the rest is history. When the Nazis gained power, Hitler insisted that any new member of the party had to confirm on his word of honour that he was not a member of any lodge. Freemasons were excluded from holding any office in a government department. Initially, the Three Globes was the only Grand Lodge recognised by the Nazis, and this was partly because it continued to support non-admittance of Jews, also because they thought it would give them access to the missing names, but in reality it didn't. In January 1934, <clears throat> the Grand Master of the Three Globes issued a declaration which ended with the statement, we support our Reich Chancellor Adolf Hitler. From this point, the Three Globes sunk further. They changed the ritual so that any lodge joining under its banner as a means of survival was required to remove all passwords and names appertaining to Judaism. All private lodges not belonging to the Three Globes were closed. 
The following extract, extract is a sad record of those dreadful, dark and oppressive times. It's taken from the minutes of the Disillusion Convent of the 30th of July, 1935, and it reads as follows. And with three Gestapo agents present, the brethren in Hamburg presided over by Richard Browse, the last Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Hamburg, enacted their own orderly dissolution with pride and dignity. They recounted the history of Freemasonry and then extend, extinguished the lights true to custom, closing with a prayer which included the words, we now return the working tools to your hands. These tools we and our predecessors used for nearly 200 years, working on our spirit, spiritual edifice in your honour. Not because we have become weary of the service around the pillars of wisdom, strength and beauty, but because of the demands of our government. With full hearts, we thank you for the endless, consecrated and elevating hours we were privileged to experience in this place. And the lights which continue to illuminate from there into our family and professional lives, and also brought comfort, joy and blessing to those outside our circle. A deep and painful sadness now descends upon us. Give us the strength to carry on with dignity and perseverance. We can only wonder at the spiritual strength and devotion of our German brethren, who continue to practice their masonry under the frightful oppression of the Nazi regime. I've just noticed there's some hands up, but I don't, uh, I don't actually see much on my screen. So does anyone want to interject? Don't forget to unmute yourselves. I'm sorry, say again? I think that's for questions later. Ah. At the end. Yeah, we'll do questions at the end, Barry. Thank you. Okay. So, <clears throat> lodges in Germany often met in pubs, known as a Brauhaus or brewery, so called because breweries generally had a pub attached to them and sold brewery beer brewed on the premises. One of Hitler's favourite pubs was the Hofbrau House in the centre of Munich. And he often dined and drank there, completely oblivious to the fact that there was a lodge meeting going on over his head. The SS were appalled at the prospect of Hitler discovering this, so when lodges were eventually banned, this was one of the first to be shut. And such was the violence used that some members were killed. The owner of the Hofbrau House vowed that if Freemasonry returned to Germany, he would allow lodges to meet there for free. Whether or not they do, I don't know, but they still meet there as far as I understand. Most of you will know of the Forget-Me-Not or Burgess Mine nicked to the Pelpin and how it became a symbol of German Freemasonry. Germany was in such a poor financial state that even the most basic services had ceased. Street collections for worthy causes became frequent. It was customary for donors to receive a small lapel pin as a token for their donations. The Grand Lodge of the Sun was quick to recognize the symbolic yet inconspicuous value of this pin and adopted it as an emblem of recognition. It's thus that the simple blue flower evolved and was adopted as an official symbol of German Freemasonry at a time when membership was strictly forbidden and its followers were hounded incarcerated, persecuted, and murdered. The SS leader Himmler formed the security service known as the SD. He appointed the head of the Munich police to run it. And the, ag the agency's prime purpose was to locate and destroy anything associated with Freemasonry. It became infamous for the operation Night of the Long Knives. A list of guidelines was produced for those Nazis charged with wiping out Freemasonry in Germany and the occupied countries. And I managed to obtain a photocopy, and this is some of the extracts, and it's headed Guidelines for the Confiscation and Destruction of Freemasons' Libraries. In all lodges released for cleansing, everything which consists of books or correspondence must be gathered in one place and turned over to a junk dealer. Books and magazines must be rendered in a condition such that use of these for materials for any purpose other than sending to a paper mill is impossible. Torn up, cut up. All leather aprons should be packed in bundles and delivered to collection locations in the province specified by the SD. 
or draperies of the lodge must be packed together in bales and delivered to the collection locations specified by the SD. All cloths used in Masonic labor must be included, chairs, tablecloths, paintings, flags, cushions, and Masonic symbols. All objects for the ritual of Freemasonry which bear Masonic insignias of metal must be defaced as much as possible and packed together to be junked. All Masonic symbols made of wood or similar material must be smashed and burned. These include the columns in a temple with letters J and B. Also, the symbols made of stone, glass and porcelain must likewise be destroyed. The portraits, busts, wall maxims and paintings are also to be destroyed, taking into account the fact that glass and neutral paintings can also be sold by the liquidator. Freemasons medals and jewels, which are made of precious metal, must be sent to the office of the Commissioner General in The Hague. It wasn't just Nazis who persecuted Freemasons. In 1917, the Bolsheviks dissolved all lodges in Russia. In 1919, the proletariat did the same in Hungary. Spain's first dictator ordered the abolition of Freemasonry in 1925. Mussolini did the same in Italy. Indeed, squads of black shirts raided homes in Milan and Florence and murdered over 100 Freemasons. Masters of lodges in Vienna were sent to Dachau concentration camp. And believe it or not, General Franco of Spain ordered that all Freemasons in his realm should automatically receive 10 years in prison. That was in 1940, and that law wasn't officially quashed until the 60s. During the Spanish Inquisition, Freemasons were deemed to be heretics and subsequently executed. In fact, Spain has been guilty of some of the worst treatment of Freemasons over a sustained period in the civilized world. The invasion of the Channel Islands was a testbed for the invasion of Britain. Hitler reckoned that occupying this country would tie up too many of his troops. However, if he could persuade Brits to cooperate rather than using force, this would be the preferred option. He gave strict instructions to his troops on the Channel Islands to act courteously, not to use bad language or unnecessary force. He even told them not to pick the flowers or damage property. Now, there's a common misconception about the fate of the Masonic Temple there. It was originally believed the Nazis sacked it and set fire to the building, but recent evidence suggests that the building was actually locked and a fire of unknown origin was responsible. I can't comment, I don't know. A book was recently discovered with instructions to troops who were to occupy Britain. Their first task was to round up Jews, Marxists and Freemasons. The latter by seizing the records of Grand Lodge as has been done in Berlin. They were also ordered to execute Winston Churchill. It's easy to see how history becomes distorted. You see, Hitler dabbled in the occult, in particular the Thule Society. Certain prominent members were known to have been involved with the Illuminati. The Illuminati infiltrated Freemasonry, therefore the assumption was that Hitler was a Freemason. One left-wing anti-Masonic organisation actually published a document suggesting that Freemasons started the Nazi party in order to rid Freemasonry of Jews. Let me briefly return to the 18th century. Uh, you may recall at the beginning of this address I mentioned that the Prussian government kept records of members of this time. This eventually became an important part of Germany's Masonic history, as it is contained in a collection of files, letters and documents of the order of the Illuminati. And as we've seen, quite a large number of distinguished Freemasons were members of that order. These documents eventually ended up with Duke Ernst II of Saxony. He was so convinced that his heritage was not safe from publication that he placed them under the supervision of Swedish King Karl XIII, who guaranteed that no information contained there would ever reach the public. It's very likely that he too was a member of the Illuminati, together with other members of the German royal family. In 1880, Duke Ernst II asked the documents to be returned, and three years later they became the property of Ernst Zomkobmus Lodge. These files were kept strictly under lock and key. However, in 1936, the National Socialists confiscated the documents. The Gestapo then took them to Berlin for their investigation of Freemasons. And this is the sole reason they survived. Had they not, 
most of German Masonic history might have been lost forever. They were again confiscated, this time by the invading Soviet troops and transported to Moscow, where they remained until fairly recently, where they were returned to Berlin. As I said earlier, many German and Jewish brethren met their fate in concentration camps, but some escaped to Israel and kept alive the flame of German Freemasonry during the dark years. After the end of the war, they were instrumental in restoring regular Freemasonry to Germany. But ironically, it was the Allies who delayed the return, as it was forbidden to hold meetings of any kind with more than three people present. This was eventually relaxed in 1946. The United Grand Lodge of England did not grant recognition to German lodges immediately. They therefore formed Masonic clubs where rehearsals took place until regular Freemasonry was restored. Now, German Freemasonry is very different to ours in England. For example, there's less emphasis placed on learning ritual, but officers will often read spoken parts. But the solemnity and the symbolism is powerful and impressive. The layout of the lodge and their officers differs from ours somewhat in the, whilst the master is still in the east, the wardens are placed in the southwest and northwest respectively. There's a DC, but there's no ADC. This work is done by the deacons who are effectively assistants to the DC. There's also an orator who effectively replaces the chaplain and is in the southeast, but he gives lectures and prayers. The secretary is in the northeast. Lodge meetings are carried out in complete silence apart from those taking part. Lodge is open with the master and wardens present, and members and guests are individually escorted into the temple to gain admission with a password demanded by the DC. It's not just symbolic, no password, no admission, and no prompting. Candidates are expected to make a serious commitment to Freemasonry, and research plays a major part. A candidate for initiation is asked to write what he hopes to contribute to the craft. This is then read in open lodge and the brethren decide whether or not he should be admitted. This happens on the day of his initiation. And once again, it's not symbolic, it's a deciding factor on his future in Freemasonry. It's also necessary to produce an essay of research into an aspect of Freemasonry and deliver it in the lodge before being raised to the third degree. Officers are not necessarily progressive. They are chosen democratically by the brethren according to their particular talents. The worshipful master, once elected, typically reigns for up to three years and is afforded the utmost respect. His duties are far more wide ranging than those in, our, in England and include some of the work as the almoner and, and traditionally carried out by our secretaries. Festive board is also different to ours. It's considered as a continuation of the lodge meeting and as such, there are certain protocol has to be adhered to. There are many toasts, but they're not usually accompanied by speeches. They often use large firing glasses, which they actually drink from. The meetings often start as late as 8 p.m. and the festive ball perhaps 9.30 to 10. However, it can sometimes consist only of thick bread and a thick soup and bread and large cheese board and sausages. Not exclusively so, because I've had a full festive ball there on many occasions. When I finished the original paper, I gave it to a German Freemason friend of mine who specialises in Masonic history. I wanted him to check it for accuracy. I was a little concerned because although he was too young to have served during the war, there are, as you've seen, a lot of references to it. And I wondered if it might offend him and others. He said there's a saying which goes, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. I was privileged to sit at a festive board with two elderly Freemasons, one of whom was a guard at a concentration camp and later in the SS. The other was a Jewish inmate of the same camp and now members of the same lodge and close friends. As I stated earlier, German Freemasonry owes much to those who fled to Israel. And during my research, I picked up a few interesting facts about Israeli Freemasonry. Unsurprisingly, most lodges work in Hebrew, and the vast majority of their members are, of course, Jewish. Arabic-speaking brethren, whether Christian or Muslim, and even Jews originally from Arab countries, work in lodges in Haifa, Nazareth, and Jerusalem, as well as other towns and cities. The cosmopolitan origin of its population is reflected in the large number of lodges operating in foreign languages. 
Apart from Israel's two official languages, which are Hebrew and Arabic, there are lodges working in English, French, Spanish, German, Romanian and Turkish. Three volumes of the sacred law are open side by side on the altar. The Hebrew Bible, the Christian Bible and the Quran. The official seal of the Grand Lodge encloses the symbols of three religions, the Jewish Star of David, the Christian Cross and the Muslim Crescent, all intertwined within the square and compasses. Frequently, lodge meetings are held, but joint meetings are held between lodges, so that sometimes three or more different languages are heard in the course of a single meeting. In Jerusalem, the Masonic Hall is actually inside what was once King Solomon's quarries, now known as the Cave of King Zedekiah, and they're used several times a year to conduct meetings, usually in English. Freemasonry spread throughout the world by many means, sometimes as a result of persecution, as we've seen, but also because Freemasons have in their time been a nomadic lot, travelling wherever their work took them. Visiting at that time was considered a right, not a privilege. You didn't have to wait to be invited, you simply arrived. Gradually, permission had to be sought, particularly in countries where Freemasonry, not recognised by the United Grand Lodge of England, was practised. It's true today that some Grand Lodges are still not recognised by our United Grand Lodge, but this does not necessarily mean that those individual Masons are any less worthy. We continue to respect and abide by the decisions of our United Grand Lodge, but it has to be acknowledged that Freemasonry, based on brotherly love, relief and truth, and particularly German Freemasonry, has continued to bring nations and religions together, even in the darkest moments of history. But then, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm not by any means um, an expert on German Freemasonry, but I'm happy to answer any questions relating from this research. Thank you. Barry, thank you ever so much. We're going to go straight to the questions. I've got hands up in, in the room. If we could first of all go to Gordon Setterfield. Hi, Gordon. If you'd like to unmute yourself. Hello, thank you. Thank you, uh, Barry, for the, the wonderful talk. Hi, Gordon. Uh, found it absolutely interesting uh, because well, many years ago in the early 80s, I was uh, involved in uh, finding uh, three jewels uh, that were part of a set of nine, which had been split up during the Nazi times. And uh, uh, three, three German masons had three of the jewels each. One of them uh, came to live in London uh, when he retired. And then uh, after that, he came to live in where I live in Hornsey in Yorkshire. And uh, eventually when he died, and we were clearing his Masonic uh, things out, we found these jewels and we obviously realized that they were important. So uh, our secretary got in touch with the provincial secretary who got in touch with the uh, Grand Lodge in London, who got in touch with Germany. And uh, we finished up having a, a full team visit from the German Grand Master of the British Freemasonry in uh, <clears throat> it came across by North Sea Ferries, who was only just started running in those days. And uh, they came to us, we had a wonderful meeting, and uh, they invited us back to uh, Hamburg. And uh, uh, obviously, I put my name down to go, but it was a very young mason that was there. Uh, kicked into touch, so I never got the chance to go to Germany. And as uh, soon as I saw that you were doing this talk, I tried to get in touch with the secretary of uh, the Alexandra Lodge, uh, where, where they came. They presented us with a plaque, which is hung in the lodge now. And um, not many people are, are uh, as old as me now, so there's not many the members know what it's all about and I, I've asked to get the minutes and uh, when I when I get them I'll copy them and I'll send you the copy of the minutes of that meeting. Thank you, I'd appreciate that, yeah. 
Yeah. And you're interested in uh, your future talk. I'm always interested in adding things to the to the talk and and removing things that turn turn out to be well incorrect. In actual fact, the how this came about in the first place is I was secretary of Tudor Lodge, and I had a phone call saying we've got a party of eighteen or seventeen or eighteen German Freemasons over for the weekend. They've come to go to a meeting, and the meeting isn't going to happen because it was a leap year and they've missed it. So. We had them at our meeting and they invited me back and I started going back a couple of times a year to Munich for several years. But unfortunately, my host died last year, so okay. I don't know that will carry on, I don't know. Do you probably recognise this? Oh, yes, it's it's an elongated, yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, this is, that is after... Gordon, well, sorry, Gordon yeah. and... Uh, Barry, can we can we go move on with the questions, please? Sorry to interrupt you, but uh, if we could go to Paul Greek next, please. Hi, Paul. Hi, thanks, Amit. Um, thank you, Barry. Um, that that was fascinating. I really enjoyed that. Um, just as as an aside, before I ask my question, I was interested um, when you said that in German lodges there's strict silence, and it reminded me just of our lodges where you don't hear any talking or anything while the uh, meeting's going on. Um, but I wanted to ask you, um, during the two wars, uh, there were stories going about that there were Freemasons uh, fighting on both sides. And I wondered if there's any records that you're aware of where uh, Freemasons on either side sort of helped each other. I don't have any information about that. I do have a friend who wrote a book called um, um, Freemasonry Behind the Wire, and he may well have that information. Um, he's not on tonight, unfortunately. But if you like to sort of left, send me a message or leave me a message, I'll try to find out and get back to you on that, but I can't answer myself. Okay, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Paul. Next, could we go to Philip? Hi, bro, Philip. Hello, Amit. Thank you, Barry, for this lecture. Very, very interesting. I wanted to ask you, um, in those uh, dark times, uh, of Nazi Germany and, and fascist re regimes in Europe. Are you aware of, of any historically recorded offers of help from uh, England, France, United States or other countries to the brethren that were hunted down in Germany, Austria, Czechoslovakia, Spain and so forth? Uh, and if not, do you think there should have been I'm not aware directly if there was any help issued. I mean, I have to say that at the time, because of the nature of what was happening, Freemasonry very much went underground. And so people were not, no one was likely to mention that they were a Freemason. And it was probably quite difficult to contact other Freemasons. I mean, it may well, there may well have been offered of help. And, um, if there were, I don't know directly, and I can't really speculate as to whether we should have done, because it's a it's a situation. I mean, I often ask myself, if by admitting I was a Freemason, I was going to be executed, would I would I still be a Freemason if I was going to if I knew I was going to be killed because of it? So it's very difficult to put yourself in their their shoes. I, I can't answer that. I'm afraid. Thank you. Next, could we go to Jerry Henry? Hi, Jerry. Jerry, you're on mute. Good evening, brethren. Uh, thank you very much for an absolutely fabulous talk. Thank uh, you. I'm uh, at uh, Finkel Priory Lodge in, in Durham and also Solomon Lodge 197 in, uh, in Aberdeenshire in Fraserburgh. Uh, just to uh, ask, one of the things that happened in this country quite recently was a requirement uh, from the from the British government that people who were Freemasons uh, declared their membership of Freemasonry. In your research, is was that one of the steps uh, that was taken uh, in in the early years of of, of, of uh, the Third Reich? Uh, is that something that, that that was obvious that people were being asked to to uh, expose themselves as, uh, as Freemasons? Or was it more subtle than that? 
No, it, it, absolutely. Um, there were several reasons for it. They, they obviously wanted to find out and wheedle out as many freemasons as they could. But also, like I said in the talk, that um, no uh, freemason was allowed to hold any official office in any government department. So, yeah, the question was asked. I mean, I don't can't imagine many people admitted to it, but um, yeah, the, uh, the, the Nazis did ask that question. It's quite difficult in this country at the, in the, at the, at the time because people were actually leaving Freemasons' lodges rather than declare that they were members of a lodge uh, because of the fear of not being able to progress either in the judiciary, in the civil service, That's right. in the armed forces. Yep. Uh, and, and thankfully, uh, for the strength of the, of the uh, United Grand Lodge of England and other Grand Lodges who took on the government in court, uh, we won that battle. Yes. Uh, because... Yep. Believe it or not, it was only membership of Freemasons lodges, not members membership of any other elite clubs or uh, quasi Masonic lodges. Uh, and I just found it very sinister uh, mm -hmm. and something that, that I certainly, as a, a senior civil servant, worked hard uh, to overcome. But yeah. uh, thank you very much. A very interesting talk. Thank uh, you. And, hello, and hello to Ted Jacobson. Uh, I, I caught a glimpse of you earlier, Ted. Good to see you on here. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Wonderful. Next, could we go to Matt, please? Hi, Matt. Uh, good evening, brother. Absolutely fantastic uh, lecture. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to uh, an observation that the uh, brother of the love can um, come back to the SS guard and the inmate from the concentration camp. Yes. Now, when you, you see how that has panned out in both directions, the horrors that must have been seen, and brother of the love can come back together surely that just shows the power of freemasonry throughout the ages it does it does and that that is where we are and how we should be, be behave yep incidentally um if ever you go to germany and munich in particular if you get the opportunity to visit dachau concentration camp um or indeed any of the concentration camps but dachau particularly because I, I went there and you come away a different person it's um very sobering well, thank you, Barry. It's been a pleasure to listen. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Matt, as always. Next, could we go to Mike Gale? Hi, Mike. Hello, Mike. Yeah. Hi, Amit. Hello. Thank you very much for that. Uh, thank you, Barry, for that uh, interesting talk. First of all, before I ask my question, I'd just like to say how poignant it is uh, for this Zoom meeting that our brethren are meeting in the Channel Islands uh, and we're not, and how the reverse was true at that time. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, and um, the forget-me-not, um, how did it first come about? How, how, what was the origin of that? Um, it, as I said in the talk, basically, um, organisations that received um, donations from the public they would give out a little pin, uh, a tiny little pin, enamel pin. And um, the uh, this particular Grand Lodge noticed that if they attached themselves to this, we could recognize each other, but the Nazis wouldn't put any significance to it. And that's how it came about. Why they chose the forget, I chose the forget me not because forget me not um, but other than that I don't know but that's what it was adopted so that it was a form of recognition between Freemasons. Uh, would, would they have not sort of picked a forget me not out the ground to just a, a, a normal flower to start with before it became, well, before it became a pin? I don't know if it existed before in terms of a, as a symbol before that time um, I, mean, I would assume that the, the, the particular Grand Lodge must have realise that they, they, there's a possibility of, of the wrong people uh, associating themselves with it. So maybe as a as an emblem of, um, of, of giving at the time, it didn't perhaps uh, exist and it was adopted for that reason. Thank you, Barry. Lovely. Thank you very much. Next, could we go to Othman? Hi, Othman. Hi, sir. The existence of that letter linking the Alamati and Masonry together, do you think it still holds us until now? 
because of the existence of this letter that people still perceive us as enemies? Um, I don't know if, um, if they do for that reason, because I mean, let's face it, most of our critics today are probably not aware of what went on before. Um, with regards to the, the Illuminati, which obviously in, in Germany was a, a particular threat uh, and, and caused a lot of the problems, um, the Illuminati is, is thought to have died out. Um, I can tell you from first-hand experience, it hasn't, because while I was doing the research, I was actually approached by somebody who apparently was attached to the Illuminati and threatened. Um, because I did the research while I was at work for Sky, and somebody at Sky hacked into my account, my email account, and um, I started getting emails from people in Sky who apparently had an interest in the Illuminati. And that was only 12 years ago. So the Illuminati still exists as far as I'm concerned. Um, but whether or not there's any link between then and the way we're reviewed by some people now, I'm not so sure. I think we're just viewed with suspicion because by people who just don't understand us. That's what I think. Thank you. Thank you, Othman. Next, could we go to Paul Ainsworth? Hi, Paul. Paul Ainsworth, are you still on, Paul? Oh, perhaps we'll go back to Paul. If we can next go to Norbert Schoen. Norbert, hi, good afternoon. Hi, um, I'm from Germany. Hello. Um, so thank you very much, Barry, for this excellent presentation. Uh, I, I would like to make two remarks, if I may, not really questions. Um, first of all, uh, I would like to uh, sort of uh, save the honor of the Grand Lodges you mentioned that weren't accepting Jews. This was actually not because they were uh, anti-Semitic, but because they were the three Prussian Grand Lodges who not only had the first three degrees, but also additional Christian degrees. And they said, in order to enjoy those degrees, you have to be of Christian faith. So they only initiated Christians into their system. Oh, I see. Okay. Thank One of them being the Grand Lodge that uses the Swedish, the Scandinavian system as well. So that's why they exempt Jews from membership. Thanks for that. Also, the, uh, I'll, I'll answer that passage. Yes, thank you. Uh, and we had five other Grand Lodges because, of course, German Masonic history and German history as such, because Germany wasn't one United State in, in the 18th century. Uh, and, and we called those the humanitarian Grand Lodges. And one of them was the Grand Lodge of Hamburg. I'm from Hamburg as well. And the Grand Lodge of Hamburg used to be a provincial Grand Lodge of the Grand Lodge of England oh. until 1811. But they then became independent because Germany was occupied by Napoleon and they didn't want to get swallowed by the Grand Orient. So they became an independent Grand Lodge and they accepted Jews as well, like Lessing, as you mentioned. Yes. The other thing to explain the story of the forget me not, maybe a little bit more. Um, there was a, a Grand Lodge conference from the Grand Lodge in Bavaria in Bayreuth. And they used the forget me not pin as a emblem for the participants. And later, the company who had produced the Forget-Me-Not used the same die to do the charity pins that you mentioned. Really? For which, for which the Nazis collected for um, support of people who needed help during the winter time. Yeah. When it was cold. Uh -huh. And they had different pins all the time, as you do, to keep people um, interested in buying them and collecting them. So it was unsuspicious to keep wearing that pin, which had also been used by the Grand Lodge before. So there's the connection. Right. And after the war, Theodor Fugel, the first German Grandmaster, wanted to take little giveaways to America. He wanted to get recognition for German Freemason back in America. So he went to the same company who still existed and used the same die to produce pins to take to America. <laughs> And that's how it became a symbol for German Freemasonry and ended up as being a pin that we still use today. And as you said, the, the name Forget Me, George, just offers. Oh. Oh, we have lost Brother Norbert. Uh, it's still on. Uh, Norbert, can you hear us? 
No. Well, Barry, if Norbert comes back on, we'll get him back on again. But uh, thank you ever so much for that, Norbert. It's wonderful that you've added that to us. Um, if we could next go to William Caswell, please. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Barry, I love the talk. Uh, most interesting. Thank you very much indeed. And I, I, you didn't um, cover the Freemasonry that went on in the prisoners of war um, and the various uh, prison camps. And I, I wondered if you had any comments on that. And indeed, whether they were uh, known about by uh, the guards um, at these various prison camps and were either tolerated or, in fact, put down. So I'd be interested in your comments on that, please. Well, interestingly, as I think I mentioned earlier, a friend of mine called Ian Simpson actually wrote a, a book on the subject and um, he delivers um, lectures on the subject in Essex and that was one of the reasons I didn't actually add any of that to mine because he's more of an authority on it and also we often used to you know ships passing in the night so um I stayed away from the, the prison camp. I've read his book um it's it's an excellent but it's only a small booklet um but it does cover um how um in fact if you the museum the Green Lodge there are the small um jewels that were made yes i've seen those yeah yeah and um uh, it, it illustrates all of those in the book as i understand it although as i say i'm not an authority on the subject i understand that there was some recognition between some guards and some inmates and some persons of war so that and obviously they must have um i assume covered up the fact that they were having a little impromptu lodge meeting in their in their pow camp um but as i say uh, um i'm not an authority on that but ian simpson is and if you get a chance to read his book i think it's called behind the wire and it's very good thank you very much indeed thank you thank you william we're going to take a couple more questions now brethren because we are running out of time if we could go to mike saunders next please hi mike Mike, you're on mute. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, Amit. Um, Thank you, Barry. Very interesting chat. Simple question. You referred to various records um, that were held and uh, used, particularly during the Hitler era. Do you have any knowledge as to whether or not records are currently available to of, of those that were Freemasons prior to the Second World War? And if so, where would one go for that? Um, well, the, those records that were made by the Illuminati and were seized eventually went back to Berlin. Um, if they're available in Berlin uh, for the public viewing, I'm not sure, if I'm honest. Um, okay. I think most of the records were, the reason they were, they were seized was that they were hoping to get names of, of uh, Freemasons at the time. Um, there must have been more to it than just the names. But um, yeah, I, I, I would, if I were you, I'd check through Berlin, because that's where they went back to. Fine. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Mike. Could we next go to Brother Ivo? Hi, Ivo. Hi, everyone. Ivo. <laughs> but Ivo, sorry, I'm I do beg your pardon. Coming from Berlin, actually, and half Bulgarian by descent, but very much interested, given my age, in lessons learned. I mean, it's a historic lecture. Thanks for that. Highly delighted to hear that much information among uh, and between brethren from abroad about the German uh, lodges and the, their history and, and uh, rituals, etc. pp. But um, lessons learned is much more of interest to me given my age, actually. And, and what do we know, of, perhaps given as well, the, the history of the colonization? Why hasn't been Freemasonry as attractive, let's say, for the Chinese in the past uh, or for, to other co uh, countries? I mean, it broadly has been spread in, in the former colonies. Am I correct or not? Please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so what does it mean today? Are we facing rather illiber illiberal um, cultures or regimes in, in other regions of the world that we have to uh, make up our minds in this respect and rather uh, tend to whatever, keep, keep up with brethren all around the globe and help them uh, come to terms? Thanks. It's interesting, actually, because um, when you mentioned places like China, for example, um, I've no idea. I mean, I'm assuming it's because of the the, the Chinese government, uh, perhaps not in favour of Freemasonry. But what's interesting, I, I've written another paper on the history of English Freemasonry and how far it goes back, and there's references to some of our things in Chinese uh, history way back BC, 
um, and things that we use like on the level and on the square were actually used by the Chinese and referring to, um, if you like, uh, the way they led their lives. So either we've adopted something from the Chinese or there is some link there, but other than that, I don't know. Eva, thank you very much for joining us today thank as well. Thank you very much. Greetings to you all. Next, okay, we've got our last question. If we go to Jerry Hendry. Hi, Jerry. Sorry, it was just uh, really to, to clarify a particular point. Hi, Jerry. Uh, in the uh, German prisoner of war camps, the commandant of Stalag 383, which was a very large camp that housed about 8,000 uh, British POWs, was a Freemason, and he allowed uh, Freemasonry uh, to, to uh, be practiced within the camp. Also, my uncle Morgan, who was a Freemason, who was in Changi uh, jail, uh, which was a Japanese prisoner of war camp, they also practiced Freemasonry uh, with sympathy from, uh, from uh, some of the Japanese officers. Uh, so uh, it demonstrates, I think, that uh, that uh, when you take a, a, an obligation as a Freemason, uh, it is binding upon you. And I think that that is uh, something that, that's uh, excellent. My father, by the way, who was one of the liberators of, uh, uh, of, of uh, uh, one of the concentration camps, uh, and, and was also a Mason, told me of the Masonic symbols that they found carved into the, uh, in, <laughs> into the beds and, and, the, and the walls there. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we know there's no knowledge, of course, whether or not uh, uh, lodges were actually carried up. But definitely, Freemasons uh, uh, went to their death together uh, in in those in those camps in very large numbers. Yes, indeed. Um, actually, it's funny you should, or well, not funny, but you should mention Changi. My uncle, um, he wasn't a Freemason, but he was in Changi jail, and. Oh. In, and uh, he, he actually didn't die there. He died when he came back to the UK from the, the things he picked up there, you know. Mm. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think it's, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, Freemasonry is the world over. Uh, and you know, to have a talk like this and, and to, to increase our Masonic knowledge is, is wonderful. Uh, I, I didn't know of the existence of this group. Uh, I will join this group and, and hopefully uh, uh, be able to uh, uh, to join in and perhaps share some of my Masonic knowledge as well it's in the future. Wonderful. So thank you. No existed either. It's it's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jerry. We look forward to having that conversation with you. Thank you. Well, brethren, that is all for today. Um, Quickly going to announce our winners, uh, Richard Goodwin, well done, Phil Smith, uh, mugs are on their way to you, um, look out for them in the post. Barry, thank you very much, look it's never easy coming onto a platform mm -hmm. like this and, and conducting a talk, we really appreciate your time. Um, Norbert, thank in. you very much for your comments, I'm all our questions as well today, thank you very much. Um, brethren, uh, if we could just say a very, or bid you a very, very good night, stay safe, keep well, Next week, we've got the Grand Director of Ceremonies, Right Worshipful Brother Frank Spencer coming on to oh. give us a talk. We hope to see you all next week. Same time, same place. Keep safe. Brother Amit. Good night, all.